most of us remember that feeling we had when as children we were given a box of brightly coloured ribbons of plasticine, but it would soon be forgotten because we were never able to make the clever little figures displayed on the outside of the box. We are looking back into childhood on this video, but this time our models are going to be made from sugar paste, marzipan and pastelage. <laughs> We'll start off by covering an unusual novelty cake with ready-to-roll icing. It's just like putting pastry on a pie. Just pick it up, bring it to your cake and position it in place. And indent a nice slide. Well, that's the hard work over with. Now let's start by looking at some simple hand modelling. You can use marzipan, ready-to-roll icing, gum paste or pastelage, or a combination of any of these, depending on how hard you want the models to set when they're finished. They're all edible and they can all be decorated by painting with food colour and preserving with an edible varnish called confectioner's glaze. You can also coat them with melted cocoa butter, but it's expensive and quite difficult to obtain. These have been covered with cocoa butter and the finish is a lot softer looking than this one which has been glazed. Firstly, a couple of always. Always work with scru scrupulously clean work surfaces and tools, otherwise there's a risk of causing fermentation in the marzipan. In particular, keep the marzipan away from flour and I'm actually kneading on some icing sugar. Knead it well before starting to use it. If it's too soft, add some icing sugar and this will also make it whiter. If it's still too soft, to toughen it up, you can add to each 8 ounces of marzipan up to one level teaspoon of gum tragacanth or CMC. It makes the paste more elastic and eventually it sets harder than pure marzipan. However, if you find it still too hard and crumbles easily, add a small amount of liquid glucose. White marzipan is best as it takes colour easily and it's usually coloured with a paste colour or even with cocoa powder mixed into a sugar syrup. You'll also find it helpful if you have some modelling tools and as a minimum you want a small pair of pointed scissors. Needlework ones are ideal. You'll also need a six inch length of dowel sharpened at one end. If you can get hold of some modelling tools, you'll find that they can save you a lot of time and these are the ones I use most. This one I call a dog bone and it's used for making eye sockets. This is a cone and it's very useful for making holes. The blunt knife will actually mark without cutting and I use the other end for all sorts of things. This one's very useful for making faces and you never know when you're going to use a very sharp knife, it's very important. The ball tool is used for making gentle curves and holes. If you keep your modelling tools really clean you'll find they work much more successfully and I always keep a damp cloth as I'm working. I'll also be using a number of good quality sable paint brushes. Nearly all marzipan models start off with a lump of paste about this big, about one and a half to two ounces. Roll it into a ball, it's a very important shape. You can then roll that into a cone. Keep the heel of your hands together. You can extend it even further to shape something like the head of a seal. Or if you go further still, you can make an elephant's trunk. Another very important shape is a cylinder. Now, If you use the heel of your hand you'll get a smooth finish. If you use your fingers you'll get it lumpy. Let's start with something simple and as this piece is pink I think I'll make a piglet. Just roll your finger along the top to indent it. Cut it to form the mouth, use the ball tool 
to make the nostrils and the eye sockets. Make two little holes here and here, and one at the back. Oops. Take three little balls of paste, and they are very small. Roll a ball, roll a cone, flatten it, and tuck one end into the hole. Do the same with the other one. Then roll the third one into a little sausage. That gets tucked into the back, twisted around, and then all you need to do is fill up the eyes with some white royal icing. And you can then touch them either with black food colouring, which I've got here, or with melted chocolate. And there's your little piglet. The mother pig is made virtually the same way, except that she's a bit bigger. The frog is easier still. Start with a ball of paste, but don't make a cone. Just flatten one side of it. Put it down on your work surface, and the side that you've thinned, you actually cut down and open up to form the mouth. You take another ball of paste, about the size of a walnut, roll it into a ball, and then use your little finger and you form a kidney shape, one side bigger than the other. Put that down and cut it in half. Fold one side up, stick it onto the side of the frog, make some toes and do the same with the other one. To make the eyes, you take a small ball of paste, roll it into a ball, divide it into half so that you get two equal balls, and then use your ball tool, position it at the back of the mouth and push down. So it pushes it onto the uh, frog, it makes it stick, and it also forms the eye sockets. These you can fill up with your white royal icing. And to make his spots, take a little bit of yellow paste, roll it into a sausage, make some holes in the frog, and then just put a little bit of yellow in and flatten it. and you just fill up the spots that way. I won't do them all, we'll be here all day. To make his m mouth and his tongue, roll a little bit of red, roll it into a cone and flatten it. Now only cold-blooded animals have a pointed tongue. Pop it into the mouth, use your knife, Blade, and there's your frog. You can just finish them off with some eyes. Roll a cylinder of marzipan about five inches long and cut off about one and a half inches. Just sit that on one side. Then cut about one third of the way up at each end. Use a sharp pair of scissors and snip a little V. 
bend the legs and you can already see that the shape is coming. Sit it over a rolling pin so that it has a chance to dry. And then you can make the head out of the bit that you cut off. Pinch up two little pieces at the end to form the ears. And pinch out two at the front. Snip these to form the whiskers. Oops, it's lost one. So I better put that back. Make two holes for the eyes and another one for the mouth, for the nose, I mean, and make the U shape for the mouth. You can indent the ears a bit as well. And you can sit that into place. Now if you really want to make sure they stick, then you can use a little bit of chocolate, melted chocolate. Take a little ball of black paste, roll it into a cone, and put the pointed end of the cone into the hole you made for the nose. This way it ensures that they don't come out. If you just stick a little ball on the top, you'll find that they actually will ping off quite easily. A little bit of red, flatten it. And put his tongue into place. And you can fill up the eyes with some white royal icing. bit of black for the eyeballs and finish them off by making a little tam o simply by taking two or three colours, roll them into a ball, flatten it, pop it on between the ears and a little pom-pom on the top. And there's your Scotty dog. Because penguins are white, I'm using ready-to-roll icing. 
And first of all, roll a fat cone, shape the head, just pull out a beak, tuck the shape in under his neck, make sure the tummy is smooth, and then you simply whoops, snip a wing on that side, turn him over, and snip a wing on the other side. Hand him down and just put the eye sockets in. And you must leave him to dry at that stage. And I've got one here that I've half painted and I'm just using some black food color just straight from the pot. Roll a small ball of paste. Roll it into a kidney shape with your little finger. Bend the two ends forward. Put it down and use the shell tool just to mark the feet, the flippers. Then you simply stick your penguin on top and let it dry. And this is how they look when they're at home on their iceberg. Now this is a really big model. It weighs about one and a half pounds and it's made from a mixture of marzipan and sugar paste. The wings are pastelage, which was dried into the curved shapes over a rolling pin. Flames coming from his mouth are just multicolored pastelage, cut out using a dandelion leaf cutter. You can also use the same raw materials, marzipan, pastelage and ready to roll icing with simple plastic moulds like these. Let's make the duck. First of all, grease your mould either with something like coconut oil or a release grease, which is what I'm using here. Roll your paste and make sure you haven't got any cracks or creases in the surface. Now the smooth side is the side you put into the mould. Really press it down hard so that you get the impressions going into the paste. And then all you need to do is cut off the excess. Nice finish by rolling the paste back in and then tap it out. Oops. And there's your little duck. Now I've got one here, I'll just move this one out of the way, and I've got one here that's dry so that I can show you how to finish painting it. I'm just going to use straight food colour with a little bit of water. This is a strong paste colour. And all I do is paint around the beak. And the feet. It's amazing what a difference it makes once you put the colour on them. Now let's have a look at how you would use these moulds on a cake. Now I'll show you how to use a slightly more complicated two-piece mould to assemble a teddy bear. Grease all the portions of the mould Make sure you get into all the little cracks and creases like the ears. 
the arms. And I've got some blue marzipan here. So roll it, make sure you've got a smooth surface and put it into the mold, pushing down. I'd always work with more marzipan than I actually need because that way I can get a really smooth back. Tap it out. I'm just going to put a little tiny bit of pink in for the nose and the mouth area. So first of all, put that into your mould. So you can make your moulds all different colours simply by putting the marzipan in like that. Again, smooth the icing so you've got, or the paste so you've got no cracks and creases on it. Now push it down hard. This is very important when you're moulding things like faces or fine features because otherwise you won't get the impressions. Try not to disturb it too much once you start moulding the rest of it because otherwise you'll end up with a double impression. So always do the head first and work down the torso. Take off what you don't need. Tap it out. Here he comes. Now, just make sure that your mold is free from any paste. And I'm going to put the back back into the mold just while I stick them together so I don't lose the shape. And I'm using gum arabic glue. This is a mixture of gum arabic powder and water and I mix it up on a three to one ratio so it's three of water to one of gum. Put the two pieces together. Take it out of the mould. Now it doesn't want to come. And smooth off the join lines. I like to emphasize the eyes and the ears with my modeling tools. So use the dog bone in the ears and I'm using the smaller end and for the eyes it's easy to use the bigger end. Now I'm just going to put them back into the mold so it doesn't lose the shape while I make the arms and legs. So take a ball of paste, roll it into a sausage and pop it into the foot. Just round it off. I'm not going to make these in two pieces, I'm just going to make it in one. And then I'm going to roll it out of here and put it into the other side. That way I don't actually get a, a hard seam line down the leg. Now you can finish off the foot by putting three little pads and we'll just pop that one there and we'll make another one. If you think you've got too much paste, just take a bit off. Round it, roll it out into the other side. Isn't it easy? Three little pads and pop that one there. Then we can sit the body on it. Now because your marzipan is sticky you can use a little bit of gum arabic but you'll find really that they do stick by themselves. You can position the head exactly how you want it. You can be looking down or up to the sideways, whichever way you think he looks cutest. Now make the arms. Let me just put some eyeballs on with a little bit of black royal icing or you could use a little bit of melted chocolate. Make a little heart shaped bit for the nose. I made this cake for twins, a girl and a boy.
The tiny teddy bears are all made in one piece in a mould. And to create the sitting ones, I simply folded their legs forward before the paste was set. The slipper is made in a similar manner, but as the mould is in two parts, the easiest way to make it is to let, make one side and let it dry out totally, and then make the other side. So roll out your paste. Again, I'm using pastelage or petal paste for this. Dust your mould with cornstarch, corn flour. Turn the paste into the mould. Let it take up the shape. Now I usually make the heels solid because it's the most fragile part of the mould. And build a ridge along the edge so that you've got something to actually stick the two parts together. Cut off the excess paste. This edge. This is the only edge you're actually going to see on the finished slipper. The rest of them are joins. with your gum arabic glue down the edge right around but not down this edge here because that's the open part and you simply pick up your dried piece and stick it on top making sure that you get the heel together this is what it looks like when it's decorated. Sometimes there's a wedding cake which seems just too big to tackle without an extra special top piece and that's when you really have to do some serious thinking. Fortunately we were able to find a mould which we used for making the classical vase from pastelage. Mould the two pieces and let them dry out thoroughly and then you simply stick them together with a little bit of royal icing. And you'll find that the icing will just fill in any of the cracks. And when it's dry, you can decorate it with frills, and line piping, just like you've seen. We've looked at marzipan and pastelage, but we can also mix pastelage with ready-to-roll icing. It's used here to decorate these traditional sugar-coated chocolate eggs. And these are a few of the models I've made, and each one uses an egg as its foundation. I'm going to start by moulding the head. And I'm going to use this mould, grease it just like I did the other ones, and use a bit of flesh-coloured paste about the size of a large walnut. Make sure it's smooth and push it into the, the mould. Now I really do push it down hard. Then shape the back of the head, use the rest of the paste, And the important thing about this is that you get as much paste at the back as you do at the front. 
Then use a toothpick and just push it up the neck. It doesn't matter if the back is all creased because unless he's bald, you don't have to worry about it because you're going to cover it with hair. Take it out of the mold and stand it in some foam or some polystyrene until it's dried. Make sure that the egg, which becomes the bride, is stuck in place on a tiny plaque so it doesn't roll over. Dress her with some dark pink petal paste for the first layer. What you need to do is use a garret frill cutter, cut out the circle, and I'm using the smallest of the centre cutters for this. Dust your work surface with some corn flour so that it doesn't stick. But before I start to frill it, I roll one side a bit longer to form the train. And then use a cocktail stick and roll right around the edge of the frill. Paint around the egg with a little bit of gum arabic glue. Pick up the frill and drape it over the top. Now subsequent layers are built up using paler shades and with the last layer you don't cut a hole in the top. Both arms are made exactly the same way Take a very small piece of paste, roll it into a sausage, round one of the ends, that's going to be the shoulder, make a cone in the other end, and that's where the hand is going to go, and then just mark it with your blunt knife so that you can bend it at the elbow. Now the hands are made this, the same, but do remember which side of the hand the thumb is on. It's always on the upper position. I'm just going to dust my hands with corn flour so that they don't stick. It's a very small pea-sized piece of paste. Roll it into a cone, flatten one end. Now snip it into a little V, and that's the thumb. Then snip halfway down. Don't make the fingers the same length as the thumb. Shape it and curl the fingers. Just shape under the wrist. And then that gets stuck into the end of the sleeve with just a little bit of gum arabic. wrong hand. Here was I talking about getting the thumbs in the right position. And then do the other hand the same way and they can be stuck to the top of the egg. The arms can be finished in lots of different ways. You can put frills on the bottom or cuffs, whatever you fancy. And then when they're dry, you actually put the head into place by piping a little bit of royal icing around the neck edge. And you can make this into a frill. And then you simply put the painted face down into the royal icing and leave that to dry before you pipe the hair. The bride and the groom's faces are made from the same mould. They've just been painted differently. To make these fairies, we use similar techniques, 
but the mouldings are much finer, so great care has to be taken to ensure that the features are not distorted as the figures come out of the mould. Shape the arms and legs, and if you are not sure of the angle, then look at one of these wooden artist's models. For this green fairy, I've used the oak leaf cutters to make the clothes. For the lilac fairy, I've used the orchid throat cutter and the daisy leaf. And for the man, I've used the orchid throat cutter and the straight scallop. You'll find the pattern for his top in the booklet. His upper torso is suspended from a flower hanger with two loops of florist's wire which are twisted around his neck. And to make the legs, I take some dark grey paste, roll it into a sausage. Now when you look at your artist's model, your wooden model, you'll see that the legs are actually half the height of the, uh, the body. So you can do a very general shot by just measuring your, your leg against the whole torso. First thing you do is form the foot. So rotate the paste between your fingers to thin for the ankle. Turn it and flatten it. Now remember that a man's legs are a lot more muscular than a lady's. So you can shape up to the knee. Again roll it between your fingers for the knee. And we simply paint some gum arabic on the back of that. I'm going to use a foam block so that I've got something underneath while the leg dries. And I put that into position. Now I do a second leg exactly the same way. And if you want to have the knee raised, you simply support it on another piece of foam and leave that to dry. The arms extend from the shoulder to the middle of the thigh, so don't make them too short, but you make them in exactly the same way as I did for the bride. Now to dust his tunic, put it on some kitchen towel so you don't get the dusting colour everywhere. And I'm going to start with the silver. If you position your cutter about halfway down the length and then dust this on, brushing up into the points of the cutter. Move the cutter then back towards the edge of the frill and dust it with the black. Don't push too hard on your cutter as you're doing this because otherwise you'll end up cutting through your paste. Then you need to gum around the waist of the figure for this to stick onto. Pick up the piece of paste and wrap it around just gathering it in as you go. Any excess paste you can cut off with your scissors. And you can use a modeling tool just to make sure that it's stuck, folded in over the, the leg. Right, for the top, the front of the tunic, you need to cut the shirt front. So cut down 
and then dust that area with your black. Turn it over and fold the two corners back. Make the collar. Bring it to your figure and paint some gum around the front and up on the shoulders. And position the front in place, lift the shoulders up and stick them down. little bit of gum up the sides smooth off seams. Then you just need to make the arms. I dusted the same way as the base. Make sure the arm is totally dried out. Gum the inside edge of the sleeve and wrap it around the arm. Just dusting my fingers because they're a little bit hot. Now, you're going to have to support the arm while it dries. So a little bit of gum on the top. Bring it to the torso. Position it. And then use a little bit of foam. And position it in place. You'll find that's just enough to hold it while it sets. Because you've got the w wire supporting the whole thing, it won't fall over. Then when that one's dry, you can do the one on the other side. These wings have been cut, veined and folded and now I'm just lustering them. Then just using straight black food colour I very finely paint down around the edges filling it in. You can follow a book on butterflies if you want or you can just make them up as you go along which is what I tend to do. Hair can be cut by using very fine knife blade to cut fine strands. If you're lucky enough to own a pasta machine, you can actually cut long strands like these.
There's more to sugar modelling than making three-dimensional models, so what about having a look at some ways of making pictures with icing and marzipan? This technique has been around for a long time. It's called cocoa painting. The first thing you need to have is a tracing of the picture you're going to copy. You transfer that onto a plaque, and I've actually got it on a marzipan plaque because the whole cake is covered with marzipan. I've got a bowl of hot water, and on top I've got some cocoa powder and some cocoa butter. If you can't get cocoa butter, you can actually use any sort of white fat. Mix the two together, and depending on the density of the colour you want, you add the cocoa. Now before you actually start painting, so that your colour will transfer very easily, cover the whole plaque with some cocoa butter. You find it will set very quickly, but it makes it much easier when you come to actually do the backgrounds, because the cocoa will blend in. Then simply take on your brush, and you paint. When you've got a, want a depth of colour, you just add more cocoa. And you simply build up your pattern like this. Now if you make a mistake and you want to take something off, just use a cotton bud and you'll find you'll just be able to lift it off. So you can start again. And here's what the finished design looks like. Now this is really painting with food colour, and if you keep to just one colour, it will be a silhouette like this. Transfer the design to your plaque, or your cake, and then simply start painting. Stenciling is another easy method of making a picture. Take some fairly stiff royal icing and smooth it over the top of the stencil. Now you must hold the stencil as flat as you possibly can. Make sure you fill in all the little holes and gaps. And then all you need to do is carefully lift up the stencil. Pictures can also be painted in royal icing. It's called flooding or run-out work. Make a design on good quality tracing paper and transfer it to the cake or the plaque. I always hold it in place with two pins while I scribe or trace the whole design on. Take this off and then you can start work. But first of all, you have to make your consistency of your icing correct. Now this is royal icing which I've broken down with water. And I break it down until it will find a flooding or a running consistency, what I call a count of 10. This is still a little bit thick, so I'm going to add a little bit more water to it. Stir it through. And when you take your knife out, it should find its own level by the time you count to 10, which is about five seconds. So we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and it's level. All right, you then fill your piping bags, and you start working on the picture from the back to the front. I don't use any tubes with my bags, and I have a very tiny hole, so I am controlling the amount of the pressure that works on the bag and how much icing comes out. 
If your hole is too big, you'll find that the icing will just pour out and you'll have no control on it at all. Now, you have a damp brush but not a wet brush. Never put water in it because although it's all right when it's wet, as soon as, you, um, as, soon as it's dry, you'll have swirly marks in it. With this style of icing, you can work from one part of the picture to the other, so long as it doesn't touch. So I can work over here, and here, and here. Make sure that when you put your colour in, you cover the lines. I've traced these lines on so that the camera can see them, but you can scribe them. To save time, I've actually got some that I did previously so that we didn't have to wait for it to dry. And you can see I've done the back boot, then the front boot, filled in all of the skirt and done her face. I can now work on the apron. And I'm actually going to do this with two bags because first of all, I'm going to fill in the area like this. Use my brush to move it to where I want it to go. Take it right up to the icing. Don't be frightened of doing that. If you've put too much in, you can take it off with your brush. Now while it's still wet, don't leave this to dry, I just touch with my other bag and you can see that the spots disappear into the icing, they're not raised on top. And so you just simply work round your picture the same way. Now I've got one here that's just about finished. And all I need to do is bring it to life by painting the detail. Now I do tend to use the back of my hand to make sure that my brush is fine and that I haven't got too much colour on it. Go around the outline. And paint in the hairlines and any other detail that you think it might need. I can make delicate patterns in the form of brush embroidery, which is a different sort of painting and icing. Now this can be done either with white royal icing on a coloured background or with coloured icing. Once the design has been transferred to your plaque or your cake, you can start working with a number one nozzle and some royal icing that has actually been thinned down with a little bit of piping gel. Now I add about half a teaspoon to about a cup of royal icing and the reason for adding the piping gel is it actually slows down the drying speed. Now pipe an outline and then put a bit more icing on the inside. You need a good sable brush. Now what you need to do is to take the water off the brush but keep the point flat and it's the back of the brush that you use to pull the icing down into the centre of the leaf. Now, As you're working, always work to where the leaf or the stem is joined. So here I'm piping and pulling the icing down to the stem line. Pipe that in, go around the outside. Now if it's only a small area, you don't actually need to go right round twice. You can just put a little bit of extra icing in the points. If it's a very big area, you might need to do two or three lines. And especially if you want to change colours. Take the excess water off your brush and pull the icing down. Take your dark pink 
fairly heavy because I want this to look reasonably thick. The whole idea with brush embroidery is that it should look like heavy embroidery on the edge. Pull the icing down to the center. And this process of first piping and carefully brushing the icing continues until the picture's complete. One of Elaine's favorite techniques, it really has everything. A bit of applique, a bit of modeling, a bit of painting. It's called bas relief. Because the designs can be complicated, they're made up from a section at a time, and the pieces are transferred when they're completed. Now, the easiest way is if you put them inside a sheet of plastic film and lightly oil this with some fat. That will stop your paste from sticking to it. Now, the paste I'm using is a mixture of ready-to-roll icing and pastelage, because you don't want it to set too quickly. Elaine moulds the body over the pattern and uses the modelling tool to create the contours and creases. She uses the cone tool to create the indentations for the feet. Like the fairy figures, she dresses the body with thinly rolled paste, sticking it with gum arabic, tucking it underneath. Then it's time to make the head. It's also shaped over the drawing. The shape of the face is soon revealed. A simple button nose is formed from a cone of paste. She cuts some brown paste into strands for his hair. and places it behind the head and trims away the excess. She puts it above the figure on the cake. The golf bag is a cylinder formed on greaseproof paper, wrapped around a rolling pin. When it's dry, it is taken off and the end is stuck on with royal icing. To bring him to life, add extra details like the stitching on the golf bag, the little mouse and the golf clubs. If you add a hat, you save time because he doesn't need a full head of hair. You can then spend a little longer painting the face. We've shown you some of the techniques of sugar modelling. While you think about where you'd like to begin, we'll end by wishing you successful sugar craft.